Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, this is the first time I'm using this type of mic, so please yell if you can't hear stuff. Uh, we have a great panel tonight, today. Second day of Shift has been my first time at Shift. It's a great conference. Uh, just a bit of about me. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm Croatian originally, but I've been based in Japan for a long, long time now. Um, and I work with Nikkei, which is like the world's biggest media, uh, business media publisher. Also for the audience here in Europe, we, uh, about four years ago, we acquired the Financial Times in terms of media size that you probably heard of. Um, it's good to be back home. It's good to see great events like this uh, in Croatia. And we have a great panel here. We're going to talk about cashless societies, whatever that means. And we're going to address that uh, a bit later. And we have a mostly Croatian panel, but uh, luckily we have an Italian representative. Ellen, I noticed the Italian water you brought as well. On stage. Yeah. It was like, so we have. Um, so uh, I'm going to start uh, with basically, it's probably best if you introduce yourselves and tell us more about what you do. Also about your companies and your backgrounds. You have some local products here, more local and more international products. Maybe some users uh, use it here, but we also have audiences from abroad. So please do start and tell us about what you do, your background, your companies. We're going to start from far out. Luka, perhaps. Hi. Hey. Uh, my name is Luka Tomaskovic. I work in Zagrebačka Bank. Unicredit Group, uh, more than 20 years of experience, uh, and currently responsible for uh, in retail division for strategy and mobile banking and all this uh, development. So, of the products, it's Mzaba, which use, people know. One of the recent products, uh, EasyPay, which is a P2P service. So, let's say shortly about me. Thank you. Please. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Donev. I work for uh, Erste Bank for about 15 years now, previously working in uh, risk management, but as of lately, in the last two and a half years, heading the team that uh, developed and still developing and running the Kexpay app in Croatia, which is a peer-to-peer -peer app published by Erste Bank, but open to anybody to use in Croatia. Thank you. Elena, please. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So, as uh, Nicola mentioned, I am Italian, coming from Milan today. Uh, so, actually, I started my career in tech. I don't come from finance as a background. I come from tech, so I started my career uh, launching Uber, together with other two people in Italy, uh, really early days at Uber, so at the beginning of 2013, when we were 100 people globally. So, I spent four years at Uber, and uh, when I left, we were 15,000. So, as you can imagine, I could actually another reality, another company, a different, uh, a different company. And uh, I decided to jump into fintech world uh, over, uh, over three years ago. And my main experience prior to Revolut is at Circle. Circle is uh, the leading crypto finance company based in Boston, with uh, offices also here in Europe, in London, Dublin, etc. So I joined their team starting as a general manager for Italy, then for an uh, Italian duck, and then uh, I relocated to London for uh, an European role. And, uh, and then actually Revolut, uh, one of the biggest fintech companies uh, nowadays across the globe, uh, reached out and uh, I mean, I thought that this was really the, the perfect mesh of uh, my previous experiences in B2C and uh, in uh, fintech uh, to support uh, actually the expansion in Southern Europe. So I currently lead the growth for Southern Europe and for, uh, for Southern Europe we mean uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, Greece, Cyprus, and Malta. And of course, our global HQ is in London. Sorry, how is the region called within Revolut? How do you call this whole area? I'm sorry? How do you call the whole area that you, that you cover? Is uh, there a name so for it? No, for us, it's Southern Europe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like this? all these areas, are, all the, all the, those markets are Southern Europe. Then, of course, we are divided into regions. We have the UK and Ireland, Nordics, Central Eastern Europe. For example, so Romania, Bulgaria, Poland are under uh, Central Eastern Europe, and we work. Uh, honestly, I always say with the with the most beautiful and sunniest countries, so with the Medi Mediterranean, and uh, yes. So Thank you. Based in Milan. Thank uh, one more, Daniel, on the side of uh, one of the big four <laughs> consulting sites. Please give us your. Yeah. So, hello. My name is Daniel. I'm a partner and board member at KPMG, uh, leading the consulting practice mainly focusing on um, 
helping uh, financial services clients select and implement technology solutions. In the recent years, mainly consumer facing, 19 years at KPMG, before that IT in financial services sector, and a customer of all three banks to my right. <laughs> All right, thank you all for, for this great introduction. Uh, really a lot of experience here on stage, and I think uh, it's going to be interesting to, to our audience. So I'm going to start with a very basic, uh, maybe obvious question. Uh, maybe you can ask the audience, how many of you know what a cashless society means? Does anyone? About 30 40% 30 of the audience? Yeah, that's, I thought I'd know that as well, but it's a bit more complicated. Um, what, from your perspective, as your roles or personally as well, what do you understand as cashless society? I mean, just a bit of, a few days ago, I was in Singapore at a big fintech festival there, and the head of digital currency for the PBOC, the People's Bank of China, said, we're not going to achieve cashless society, but he's aiming to do a cash light society. So that's a new term that I'm using now, cash light society. But what does it mean for you, cashless society? Who wants to start? It's a, it's, it's a kind of a hard question. I can start? Yeah. If you want. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll pick someone. That's how okay. it goes. I can start. So for me, a cashless society, and I think this is the common meaning, is a society and actually a life where uh, we don't want and need to pay with cash anymore, but we just can live our uh, daily habits uh, in finance and not only. So everything related to money and not only, with digital payments, I would say. And uh, when uh, Revolut crossed my path, uh, I, I thought that uh, to actually to, to join and, and to lead the, the growth in this specific region was the real challenge. And that's why for me it was uh, very exciting to, to accept this role and to jump on it. Because, uh, you know, like uh, imagine London or the Nordics, for example, or Singapore, uh, that you probably know much better than me, uh, are already like very like very attached to digital payments and uh, they are used to to, to live with, with that in uh, southern europe we are uh, far away right mm -hmm. especially if we think about uh, all the cities and uh, all the actually all the small villages places outside big city centers okay of course in milan in zagreb in, in Turin, in Rome, in Madrid, uh, we are starting to see people uh, getting used more and more to this. So it's becoming just n normal also for the merchant to accept uh, the, the card, the debit card, the credit card for any even m small transaction. While until uh, literally like uh, just a few years ago was not like that at all. Uh, but if you go outside this big city center, it's not like that at all. No? So a cashless society will happen if this will real, really happen uh, when uh, all the ecosystem will be integrated uh, in order to support this evolution. No, not only the, the person who wants to pay with a digital payment, but also no, all, the, all the ecosystem around uh, who, is, who is ready to accept it normally. Perfect. Uh, so we, we do need infrastructure. Guys from the institutional side, you have some. Uh, for me, I'll give you a, an example. Last year I went to um, Copenhagen and walking around a market, uh, just a regular market where people sell fruits and vegetables, there was a lady selling cherries and she had a little piece of paper like torn from a, from a notebook and she had a number written on it, 75643, and that's her payment vehicle. You open an app, you type in that number, and you pay her for the cherries, and she gives you the cherries. What app was it? It's mobile pay. Okay. It, it's, a, it's a Danish uh, yeah. uh, thing. Um, but that's a cashless society where you can pay for cherries without special gadgets or uh, merchants having to have equipment or lots of like um, the technology. Extremely simple for the vendors, which are really simple. Like she has one product, just cherries, nothing else. So she doesn't need a sophisticated system. Same thing with some Vietnamese uh, spring rolls. Same thing, a number written on a on a piece of paper, and you pay, and and it's done. When we can achieve something like that, that would be my definition of cashless society. Of course, in Croatia, we are at 80 something percent still cash transactions, which we have a lot. A lot of work to do. 
Yes. Uh, Luca. I don't know if we need to, to aim to the cashless society, especially when we talk about Croatia, because I think the majority of people here are from Croatia. I don't think this is the ultimate goal, because you can be uh, developed, you can uh, pay with your card what you, have, what you can do now. So I think that uh, what is uh, important uh, now to do, especially in countries like us, that uh, we have means which are not just the credit card that you can pay. So, okay, it can be a credit card, but you can also pay with, uh, your, with your mobile, and that it can be accept accepted uh, all around uh, the Croatia. So if, I, if you ask me uh, about the Croatia, yes, definitely there are a lot of uh, cash transactions, but you see that now, Almost everywhere I talk about the cities, okay, because the cities there are more transactions. You can pay with a card and you can pay with a mobile if there is a contactless uh, behind it. So uh, I think this is where we need to be. We need to have this uh, possibility and, of course, to create uh, something what can be used also outside of Croatia. So not just to have closed loop, uh, uh, let's say, products which you can use in Croatia, then you pass to Slovenia and you cannot use. So I also see the cashless society in a way that, uh, you know, product you are using in your country can be used in other countries, can be paid there. So this is where what uh, I think is what the aim of the cashless for me is that I can use what I use in my country in all other countries. Regardless of I, do I ever pay something with the cash. I mean, why not? Mm -hmm. But not everything. That, that reminded me when you said going to Slovenia of not many, not so long ago, we, when we traveled to other European countries, we had to pay for mobile roaming, a yeah. lot of money. Yeah. So if someone would call you abroad, you were like, don't call me, I'm abroad. Yeah. And now it's completely normal to travel to Holland or, but, or, or but, Denmark and you have the same rates. Yeah. Uh, but it took us some time to get there, right? Quite a long time. Daniel, your, your view of a, of a cashless society? <clears throat> well, if I look at, uh, Croatia or this region, I think, you know, there are a number of factors um, why the take up on cashless was not as fast as in some other regions. I would say, okay, one could be, you know, the habits of people thinking that paying with cash means cost control. But uh, what we have learned in many other cases of technology is that consumers actually are able to change faster than, than actually service providers or, or infrastructure. Uh, so that's only, I think, a lesser reason. I think there are other reasons coming from the merchant side, banking side in terms of, for example, uh, cash handling fees in Croatia have been historically relatively cheap compared to other countries. So for merchants, hand, handling cash was not that expensive. So it was not driving them more to cashless. Uh, bank fees until you know, the European Union regulated the, um, the car transaction uh, fee maximums were also a relatively good source of money for the system. Um, a bit tax evasion, you can say, or reporting every sale was another reason. So there, there, there are a number of factors which meant that we had historically in this region quite good card penetration and relatively bad activity per card, especially when you take out the ATM withdrawals uh, out of the picture. Um, and <clears throat> I mean, this is where we are. Uh, the point that, that we can take from, from here is that with fintech innovation and convenience of mobile payments and the maturity of the payment area of the fintech industry. And just to give you an idea, last year I think about 60% of investments into fintech was in payment related fintechs. So there is maturity in that part of fintech world and there is also consolidation, economy of scale. So I would say probably Croatia and these countries will skip the intense use of plastic as an evolutionary step between cash and mobile payments and just, you know, jump straight through more into mobile payments because of convenience, not having to remember all the pins, etc., etc. So sometimes it's good to be a little bit behind and then you can leapfrog. Yeah. Um, a little bit more about numbers and quite a few of you mentioned this now and backstage. Then you said 80%. Of uh, or it was Lucas? I forgot. Like uh, Leon said, 80% of transactions are still in Croatia. We're talking about, uh, and maybe if you have any other numbers here, because you also said there's a lot of plastic, but it's not really being used as in other countries, right? In Croatia, what, what did you have the numbers for that? Like, yeah, it's more than 80 actually. Yeah, I don't know. Every year it changes, 82, 83, 84, whatever. It's a uh, 
Eight, okay. The, the regulator knows exactly, so it's 88. That's a pretty uh, high number. Yeah. A very, very high number. In, in number, in volume, of course, it's a different story. There are some digital transactions which are of huge volume and it changes the, the percentage, but we're talking about numbers or everyday use, so it's very high. Yes, number of uh, uh, plastic cards is, is also very high. And I think Daniel mentioned that if you take out um, cash withdrawal at ATM, about 30 kuna on average, uh, 30 transaction on average a year are done with a plastic, which in a year, that's, that's pretty low. And that's like two a month, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. very little. And I think it's a big divide between uh, big cities and, and uh, uh, smaller communities, yeah. In Zagreb, you see people everywhere with cards, but uh, then you go to other places, it's, it's very different. And also, let's say ATMs, they are stable. So you don't see decline on the ATM uh, withdrawal. Okay, there are also tourists coming here, so you have this type, but you know, you have a flat line with the ATM transaction, so there is no less need of, of course, and the cards go up. So it's ATM flat and the cards go up. So this is the idea. So still, people are using cards to take the ATM, uh, the cash out of the ATM. But this is it, this is how it is. So. Elena, and you, you as an international product on a global scale because you open even beside Europe. But uh, if we focus on Europe, and you mentioned the difference between Northern Europe and Southern Europe, and maybe UK and Ireland, what are the, the different numbers there? I assume Northern Europe, as you said, in places like Singapore are much more advanced. But you know, so our main market, as mentioned by you, is Europe. And of course, uh, the first market in Europe is the UK where we were born, okay? And uh, we are starting now to launch outside Europe. So we launched the three years ago, um, I'm sorry, three months ago, Australia. Uh, we just launched the, like three weeks ago, uh, Singapore. And uh, we are going to launch the US, uh, New Zealand, Japan. Uh, and we have a very intense roadmap of expansion uh, in, the next, uh, in the next months. What I can tell you is that the, grow the growth I see in Southern Europe. So actually the customer is ready for this type of innovation because uh, we are seeing Italy, Spain, Croatia growing so fast uh, that it's impressive. Uh, just to give you an idea of the Croatian market, uh, I came over uh, Zagreb, uh, at, at, I would say at the end of May, okay, and we were uh, 20,000 customers. Now uh, we are over 70,000 customers. And uh, so like the, 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 the answer to this type of product is incredible. Also Italy, uh, it's growing like uh, faster than uh, any other markets, I would say. So uh, the, the customer is ready. And also, there is another thing to add, that we have more and more people, uh, uh, like young professionals, etc., that are starting to move constantly for work and also for passion. And so they get used to, to use this type of product uh, in their daily life. And when they are abroad, they are uh, familiar with that and they use it more and more, no? So it's a cycle. and. Uh, the thing is that absolutely the, the customers, especially customers uh, like with a higher education, are absolutely ready for that. And uh, the, the, the challenge I think we all have here in this room is to make uh, the entire society understand the value uh, of the cashless society. Also, for example, the cost uh, saved by the institution uh, in order to actually manage, to produce, manage, control the cash per year are incredibly high. I can show you, for example, the numbers of Italy, Banca d'Italia, so the, the regulator, Banca d'Italia, spend, yeah. spends uh, 8 billion per year in order to just to manage, I'm um, sorry, to manage the cash we have uh, in the nation, and okay, so, and this is the same way for all the other markets, so very high cost. So the challenge I think we all have is, first of all, to educate people, not only very international travelers, uh, young professionals, but everyone, to the value and uh, the added value of these services, and then to make really everyone understand uh, how this can impact uh, in the entire uh, country. Right. Uh, look at that, maybe, like, are the challenges the same in Croatia for you, as Elena just mentioned? Well, uh, absolutely, the cost of cash uh, for banks are bigger than what banks can earn from that side, but we need to also understand that uh, uh, what what colleague here said that you know young professional cities absolutely they are aware of it but you when you see your base of the clients you are going from you know zero to 75 80 years so you cannot 
uh, at the moment uh, educate some of your clients, especially elder want to use the cashless. So the cash will be there and we will need to handle and we are happy when the clients use our ATM because then, you know, maybe they don't need to go to the branch and in the branch uh, maybe uh, not to have uh, queues. And so this is the thing which we are still having. So we are still trying to explain some people to use the ATM. And this is the, the reality which we have now. Of course, there we also have in our base clients who do not need cash and they pay everything with the, with the mobile and, you know, they maybe don't go to the branch even once a year. But this is the challenge which the banks uh, in these countries have. So they need to manage all of that, uh, all of that uh, complexity. And this is what we are trying to do as a like Bochka Bank. Okay. Uh, Anil, maybe you, you work with general institutional clients, you saw some big fintechs as well, uh, fintech startups. When you work with them in terms of cashless, going cashless, digital, and so on, what are the biggest challenges in your relationship with them in terms of not maybe implementation, but even starting from understanding that issue or problem? <clears throat> I think if we talk about uh, cashless and payments in general, I think most traditional banking providers understand that this market is being disrupted. And I mean, just to give you an example, uh, as Elena said, if all the young people in Croatia or a lot of young people in Croatia will start using Revolut as a convenient multi-country transactional account and payment service provider, that's taking the future customers, the future lending customers also from the traditional banks. So in a way, you are disrupting now the younger generation who are mostly interested in payment products and you're taking the data about their spend, about their behavior from the traditional banks who see them also as lending clients and deposit taking clients. And this is disrupting the market from the payment side. And you know, 10 years down the road, that really presents a challenge about understanding your consumer if he's not doing the daily banking with you and then you need to uh, approve a loan for that person. This is also disrupting the um, easier part of the market to be penetrated. And this is why fintechs in payments are the most mature. Uh, if, if you look at Revolut, Elena will know better, but I think they, uh, until today, they raised about 350, 400 million euros of capital, a bit less than that. And they are now raising another half billion. Uh, no, we didn't confirm at the last round, okay. honestly, not really. Not like we don't, we don't know and uh, we, don't, uh, okay. we don't confirm. Uh, but we raised uh, 336. Okay. So far, for a valuation of 1.7 billion. So that's the valuation 1.7. The current yeah. valuation is 1.7 okay. billion. Yeah. So, so you have a financial services provider, which is basically already, you could say, a global daily transactional bank, with a capital value of below 2 billion euros, which I think is in the range of these two guys there, who are a national bank or mm -hmm. national banks. So, with relatively lower capital requirements, you are building a global digital bank for payments and transactional services. For lending, it's much more regulated and more difficult and capital intensive, so that will be a harder nut to crack as a fintech, but you will have the customer data. So this is disruptive, clearly, and traditional banks are reacting to defend that, let's say, capture of daily interaction with customers. The challenges are technological. It's easier to build a bank from scratch with new technology then to integrate all the backend systems to have seamless customer experience. And some clients that we work regionally are, you know, traditional banks that need to overcome these issues and accelerate innovation in that side. And when we work with global banks, like we helped in, I mean, in three years, we helped Goldman Sachs Marcus build a digital bank mm -hmm. from nothing. They were not a retail bank. They had a really strong brand, which is one of the leading digital banks today, globally as well. And it's, it was easier for them because they could just, you know, select the what, leading yes, technology you say leading, pieces sorry. and build it from scratch. Goldman yeah. Sachs uh, retail digital bank is one of the leading ones in terms of users or? In, in the, well, they are predominantly US, but yeah. they are, uh, you know, a uh, few million customers, $50 uh, billion dollars in deposits. They also offer cash loans, brokerage services. So in the US, they are very successful. They launched UK end of last year, I think quarter of a million customers, so not still in Europe, nowhere close Revolut or N26. Uh, Elena, do you, see the, do you see them as competitors? But, but yeah. But actually, you know, like uh, we partner with the traditional banks, so we see more and more uh, traditional players to partner with fintechs. So 
traditional players, uh, old banks, let, let's call them like this, realize, right. realize absolutely uh, the need of, uh, of uh, actually to innovate and digitalize themselves. But as mentioned already, uh, it's very different to build it from zero with a tech approach, you know, with a scale-up approach. So we always say we are first a tech company, then a financial uh, mm -hmm. company, and then makes total difference. While a traditional bank to digitalize have to build a brand new team from zero, but not only, not only to invest billions to digitalize themselves, but also to completely change the approach, the culture, right, the speed, etc. So we see more and more traditional players, of course, uh, look, uh, look a lot after uh, like new innovative player like fintechs, partner with them, or in certain cases buy, for example, smaller fintechs to enter in some markets, etc. But uh, we will see more and more this uh, this uh, cl uh, close relationship, and uh, and we see like these two different worlds to co to coexist actually and to speak. Uh, more and more together in an integrated way. Mm -hmm. uh, trick question for the audience. Do you guys know how many branches does Revolut have? <laughs> does anyone know? Branches. How much? Someone said here. I come on, don't be shy, people. We have to make this more interesting. Does anyone know how many branches does Revolut have? Zero. That's it. Zero is the right. Am I correct? It's correct. Zero Our correct. model is not physical. It's uh, entirely on app, not even uh, on the desktop, on the app. And uh, so, as you can expect, our main target are, uh, as I mentioned also before, young people, OK? Yeah. Uh, consider that the average age of a customer in Europe is 34 years old, OK? So he's not so young. He's a young professional, OK? Uh, and, but the challenge, I think, we all have as a fintech, so not only Revolut, but in general, is that the young people are less loyal mm -hmm. than o o older people. Like, Damn for example, people. my mother, yeah. no, like uh, she had uh, the same banks for 30 years, right? And then she started to use Revolut, and the product is so intuitive that she now just use and live on Revolut. But a part of that, but a part of that, for in in the challenge we have is to really like be constantly the best product outside. And uh, we all have like uh, us and 26 Monzo because uh, the millennial is less loyal. So they really just look for the best option, the, the most convenient, the most transparent, the most, uh, the, 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 the easiest uh, user experience, mm -hmm. right? So this is a challenge not only for us, but also for the traditional player. Now the customer really uh, starts to, to be at the full center of the entire product. Ha a question for the Croatian guys here, just quickly. How would you rate the, because again, coming from Japan, actually Japan is not that advanced in terms of this kind of cashless society yet. And so my experience with the Croatian banks, uh, some of you here, uh, is actually really good uh, in terms of digital experience. Uh, and then I think what Luca mentioned before and tied up to what Daniel and Elena said, like building from behind, like you guys have to have branches in every town in Croatia and every village in Croatia and so on. And this is enormous costs in handling that you have to work with in providing a new digital service. Um, I mean, how, what, what are the like, other biggest challenges? How did you push in Croatia such good products that are used by people? I mean, I think, I don't know the exact penetration numbers, I don't know if they're public, but it's going pretty well for you as opposed to some other countries where, where traditional legacy banks are actually struggling quite a lot. So how did you achieve that? Is the UX, is it the education part? Yeah, we, we talked about uh, cashless and getting people to use digital products and not cash, but people are not using a lot of cash because what are the alternatives? So when we started uh, building a product which is attacking the most cash heavy use case and that's uh, exchange of money between friends. Uh, settlement of debt, of bill splitting, collecting money for birthdays or whatever. This is a almost 100% cash activity. And 11 months ago, almost all of that was done in cash. And now we are at a phase where uh, 75,000 people use the app and we have reached almost half a, uh, half a million kuna a day 
which is not done in cash, but is done with an app for bill splitting. Just bill splitting, mainly lunch, dinner, and, and whatever. So when you give the people an option, which, as you said, and I, I firmly agree with that, and, and Elena will agree, of course, UX is absolutely uh, UX is the king. number one uh, thing. All of the reviews that we get and all of the users comment on simplicity. They could have done build split before in a digital way, but they didn't. Uh, people didn't do it. They did it in, in cash. So when you present an option which is so simple that uh, anybody can use it, and we, we have users of 65, 70 uh, years old use the app, then they will, they will switch really quickly. I mean, in one year, uh, a very rapid shift in, in the direction of this one use case that is, that is covered currently. We're going to attack the other use cases, like payment in stores and um, uh, buying tickets and, and all of these use cases where cards are not even an option and cash is currently the main, uh, main option. But um, every use case is very specific and you have to adopt to it and, and find the best UX for the customer to feel, okay, this is so much better than cash. It's not about uh, the cash is expensive or somebody in the government said that we should go to a cashless society and uh, somebody decided this is the direction we want to take but people look at it and say wow this is so much more convenient and, and so so much easier uh, forget about cash a lot of people say I will never go back to, to using cash for these kinds of transactions anymore. I have to press the button and it has to work. Yes. That's it. Yeah. And, exactly. then, uh, and then I'm going to use it. Uh, Look up our experience, it. I think that the, at the moment, uh, one of the biggest challenge for everybody is to download something. So that the, the client, to push clients to download. And the experience we had is that we start really early with, as a Zagrebačka bank, really early with mobile banking, 2008. And we build, you know, through times, uh, more than around 400,000 monthly active users. And uh, this is where you can also be very good that you are carefully putting on the shelf of your mobile banking the new stuff. So you don't need the new downloads, you just need to do it. Of course, is, it should be very intuitive, UX should be good, but it's very important that you, know, you use the people who go to your mobile banking, who are daily there, and then you surprise them with something new and then they start to accept. So here you can skip the you know, hard part of why should I download something, how do I know? So this is the way how, you know, we are all on the same market. So we are all on the same market and we are all fighting for the same mm -hmm. clients and what because young professional 35 are all uh, targeted clients of all of us. So, you know, they will choose probably one, but I think also that uh, they will also combine. At the moment, I see that they can combine, you know, they can use uh, two or three apps and, uh, well, still uh, share the revenue. Of course, somebody will lose part of the revenue which somebody else took. So this is the reality where we are now. Uh, back to something we mentioned at the beginning, um, cross-border stuff, that's a big challenge. European, global, pan-European, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Daniel has something to chip in here, but also you from the perspective of service providers. How hard is it, is it for you to, for example, like mobile banking from Zaba and Kex or, or are tools that work here that are pretty used, you guys are growing. How hard is it for you, even if you have networks in other countries, to provide such a digital service in other countries that you're present in or your partner, partners are present in, whether it's Slovenia that we mentioned before, or Austria or Italy. I guess the same question goes for Revolut. Revolut is pan-European, but you're opening all these very different markets I don't know, how hard would it be for you to go to Brazil where you have other competitors like, like Nubank or something? And, and then, of course, then you work with all this. Who wants to take this first? I can go, I can yeah. go first. I mean, like, uh, our vision is to be the first uh, global financial platform. So this is already part of our nature you know, and our roadmap uh, to expand. I think that uh, the, the secret sauce of Revolut now and probably the characteristics that uh, will allow Revolut to really become the leader or one of the leaders of this industry, the fintech, are two things. So the obsession for the product, the product is so good that uh, imagine, just to give you an idea, we grew over 7 million customers uh, just for word of mouth. Okay, so Revolut is starting just now to test the first... Does that mean you have no marketing 
expenses? No, no. So without uh, without investing, so just for word of mouth, okay. we reached the, the first seven million customers. We are now over eight million customers, and we are starting to test now. Literally in the past weeks, uh, I would say the past two months, the first advertising activities not to test across uh, across the globe, across Europe mainly. But uh, just to, this is just uh, to give you an idea uh, about the fact that the product is so good that uh, it just grow because of the word of mouth so people are find it so intuitive and convenient and transparent that, that suggest it to a friend to a friend to a friend etc and the second thing is the expansion plan so re to really be the first uh, to move so fast and to provide uh, uh, the, the same product uh, across the globe right so revolut the, the the core idea behind the product was to, to provide uh, to provide the service without uh, any additional and convenient fees on the interbank rate. This was the, the idea behind that. Around that, this very simple concept, we built an entire world that allows uh, a customer to actually manage his entire financial life through a unique place. No? You, you don't have to go on another place to actually to start uh, investing in crypto or uh, to access to the trading platform, for example, uh, uh, we offer now from the US, uh, the US uh, market, or uh, just to donate to a charity, right? Or to really see and to manage your daily budget, for example, to see the category of spend. Um, last month I spent X in restaurants and X in travels, uh, in uh, transportation, in uh, food, whatever, right? Uh, so, like really to, actually to make a person, an average person, not a professional, closer uh, to his money, to manage his money and to just to do it in a simple uh, way. We don't uh, add any hidden commission fees, so everything is incredibly transparent and it's safe. What does it mean to be safe for me? Let's suppose that I am uh, on the opposite side of the world and uh, I lose my card, I can immediately from the app block it so no one can steal it and use it. Uh, if I see a transaction, uh, because after any, any transaction you receive, you receive immediately a notification. If I see this notification, I, if I don't recognize the no, this notification, also I say, no, I, um, this is not mine, I immediately block the card. If I forget the PIN, or if I want to change the PIN of my card, I can find it immediately on the app, right? So actually I can do, it, it's a bit of a change the paradigm, the paradigm through which a customer can do everything independently, no, from anywhere, anytime. Also, of course, we have the customer support available 24-7 in the main languages across the globe, but at least mm -hmm. a customer is independent to use it everywhere. And to, no, to, be, to start to become more confident with this type of products, can I add one, one last thing? Uh, we are also going to launch at the beginning of next year a kid's product, and I really can't <laughs> wait for this product because I think this will be a real revolution again. What does it mean? Of course, the, the kids app will be related to the family, to the parents' account, and the, the mom, the father uh, can decide if the kids can do, for example, online transaction or recurring transaction, or if, it, if the, the, the kid can withdraw or not That's money. That's very no? useful video but, games, yeah. But imagine, you know, like, uh, the, the kid can start to really manage his first money and to save a bit of the money for uh, the gift for a friend. Sp speaking of banking of the unbanked. So really to educate right? like any generation yeah. through, through the cool. product. So many, many offering you products, but uh, speaking of more, like you guys are more local, countrywide, regional, how hard is it? I mean, you, like Revolut is a global unicorn right now. How hard is it for you to go to like say neighboring markets? Well, if we talk about, you know, the, the, the focus of the bank like Zagreb, Bacca, which is a part of some uh, group like Unicrate, which is uh, in more than 10 countries, is to focus on uh, the country where it is. And to focus that the client, when they're traveling, they have all they, what they need. So our focus is not that we as Zagreb Bacca expand. Our focus is that our clients do not need some other product because they can do uh, everything by themselves. Meaning when you travel, what you need is a credit card, you need your mobile banking as some part, and you need the tools which are to, let's say, uh, try to, as uh, you said here, block your card, expand the limit, decrease the limit. So this is something what I think uh, we are doing very successfully. 
we see a real big, big growth of using of cards abroad. So I can say that the usage of our clients in card is much higher in abroad than in, in Croatia, mm -hmm. because in Croatia, the still cash cash is the king. And the they, when the they go to abroad, uh, they, they, let's say, uh, maybe because of the convenience pay with the card. So this is happening. And our, our job is that our clients can, when they uh, when I talk about uh, abro uh, other countries, they can use our bank. They don't need anything else, and this is the goal. So it's quite easy and uh, will not go far from that for us because Unicredit as a group will try uh, is, is creating something in each bank that the clients can have the same experience. Mm -hmm. the, the, the maybe you, I'm going to ask you a question maybe about competitors as well than you because you know the market so well. For example, Kex and Revolut are in, in a way competing in the services that Kex provides, right? Uh, in Croatia, obviously, and, uh, I can do. I can. Is do you think this is? Uh, is it good to have competition on on on, on Competition on, is always a good thing, <laughs> honestly. So we all pro competition here so, in the panel. No, and also uh, I think local, uh, but also global uh, players uh, are doing an amazing job. So and this is the challenge, right? To really give the most complete offer and to always improve and improve the product. If I can add one thing about the Croatian market specifically, Croatia are, Croatian, are not, uh, Croatian people, customers are not uh, so confident in doing, for example, in buying uh, from e-commerce. No? So they are not so confident yet. In Italy is the same, right? Okay, and in Greece is the same. And uh, for example, one thing, one feature that is really used a lot uh, on our card is the disposable card. What does it mean? So uh, we offer, so when you download the Revolut, uh, you immediately get uh, a virtual card, okay? And you can uh, attach it to Apple Pay or Google Pay and uh, use it from the, in, like, uh, the beginning. If you want uh, the, the physical card, you, you get this as a standard product, or we uh, offer other two type of plan, pay, uh, like you, okay. and you get charged. Very but quickly, we're running no, out of yeah, time. But the, the, this, the disposable, uh, disposable card is, uh, is made, made for uh, online payments. So every time you pay online, actually the card completely changes the number mm -hmm. and uh, gives you another number from zero, so like a, new, a brand new number, so uh, no one can clone your card uh, mm -hmm. on uh, online transaction. And this is very used mm -hmm. uh, in Croatia yeah. as well. Daniel, maybe you quick comment about this comp uh, is a perspective from the consultant, someone who works with clients competition in these fields? How does that, that pan out? Local, global? I would say, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a race, let's say, whether the fintech can uh, uh, build client base and client relationships faster than the traditional bank can innovate in technology in the front end. And every side has some advantages. You know, for a fintech company, it's much simpler organization, uh, technology from scratch, so no legacy. Uh, and, and single platform, so very focused company. For a traditional bank, I would say if you compare the number of customers that Revolut has and what would be a traditional bank size of organization with 8 million customers, it would be probably like 10,000 people or so. Uh, uh, so you can imagine you know, the complexity of large organization decision making and, and legacy technology, but a history of uh, customer relationships, regulatory relationships, and, um, and a, 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 a wide portfolio of products. Uh, so I think it's not a race where one side will be the winner, but it's pushing the other side, uh, you know, fintechs push banks to innovate on technology and customer experience, and banks are pushing fintechs to expand the product portfolio, which increases complexity for them as well. Uh, and, and they have the advantage of history and branding. So I think it's actually very good for, bo for both sides. And I think in the payment area, the, that part of the market, in the end, you will have a limited number of very big fintechs which will become closer to traditional banks in that area. And traditional banks will need to offer similar user experience. And then the competition will move to the next layer, wealth management and lending, quite the, the next two frontiers for scale and competition and then probably finally insure tech, which is still much smaller. New products, and we're going to come up with new disruptors probably at the time and so on. Uh, we ran out of time, but we're going to have to take a few questions. Otherwise, it's not really interactive. Does anyone have a question? There is one question there, like third row on the right side. Let's address it very quickly, and then we're going to wrap up because I think the production team will chase us off the stage.
Just introduce yourself, please, as well. Hi, I'm Nick from Electrocoin. Uh, so, uh, lower penetration of cashless in rural, rural areas, as was mentioned. Uh, what do you think, what, what would the, the main factor be? Uh, except for older age, of course, but there are also young people there. The anecdotal evidence shows infrastructure is there. You can pay cashless in every village in Croatia. So, why is the penetration lower, if you have the information? I think the gentleman on the left here too well, can answer because this. still uh, the younger people are not the heavy spenders so you know when you see the volumes uh, when you see who is paying in the shop uh, when you go to some of the merchants they are not the ones who are spending the big volumes they are spending maybe the transaction and still the young people are also when we are talking about under 18 they not usually have still here the card so still the the big spending is on the uh, 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 people who are more for cash. If you look into the, the, the let's say, the structure of people uh, to up to 35, you can say that, you know, it's a totally different story. It's much more close to what they say uh, Denmark or countries like this. But they are still part of the country and where you take all of this, then you get the 88% of the cash transaction. So it is really because of the, our structure of our, um, let's say, people who live here. Maybe also people have to yeah. see the benefit of alternative methods of payment from cash. You have to show them why is it better to pay with a phone. Um, it might be really hard to get young people in the rural areas to go from cash to a car than to a phone. I think it would be so much easier to go from cash to a phone and, and kind of jump over the plastic. But they need to see why is it better. Why is it better this way for me instead of cash? What's the advantage? If you give them certain advantages to this way of payment, they will come. And we've seen this example in, in several areas. If you give them easy way to pay for transport, like buses or something like that, which they use, they, 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 uh, they also use uh, this kind of uh, uh, payment. And if you give them certain benefits or certain advantages that they get gain advice or insights or, or something or loyalty points or whatever you have to give them something more than cash uh, and even more than plastic sometimes they will come if you just try to convince them yeah it's the same just move to another method it's not working obviously so clear benefits and clear like added value for for the new customer because the, you all the services that you offer are pretty great but you will have to expand by the nature of the product you will have to go in the rural areas, you will have to go to new markets, not necessarily, as you said, but, but in terms of, of uh, even retention. Um, we're completely out of time here. They're going to kill us here. But just very quickly, I like to play a game at the end. I, I, we work with CB Insights, which is a very great analytics, analytics company in tech. So they always do at their events this game at the end called Underrated, Overrated. And there's so many things that we haven't talked on this panel because time ran out. Uh, we haven't considered security and privacy, We're talking about cashless society. So I'm going to shoot a few concepts to you, and then each one of you can just answer. Nicola, I'm really sorry, but we haven't got time. The next speaker's got to rush off for a flight. Three seconds, two questions. <laughs> two questions. Really, really, really quick. It's going to be 10 seconds. All right, 10 seconds, quickly. So you, all of you can say just underrated or overrated for privacy with respect to cashless society. Is it underrated or overrated? Overrated. 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 Security? Underrated. Same. Same. Everyone agrees. I had more questions. Please come out and talk to them if you want to know more about our products. That was great. Thank you so much. <laughs>